Hello and welcome everyone. Today we will summarize the recent literature that has been published over the last couple of months. This is a part one of the presentation. The use of multipotent adult progenitor cells, that is avimestro cell for ARDS. It is again a phase two trial. This is uh, done in Japan with 29 medical centers. They included 37 patients, 20 in the intervention and 10 in the control group and the mortality rates were not statistically different however the HRCT scores were lesser in the intervention and the IL-6 and CRP levels were similar between the two groups. Now a brief regarding what this particular therapy is it is a stem cell therapy developed by this particular group for the treatment of condition, disease conditions which are like neurological immunological conditions. It's a multipotent adult progenitor cell harvested from the bone marrow of a healthy donor. Now, this is currently going on in most of the places in the phase 2 trial. It is in phase 3 trial for stroke. Currently for ARDS, it is in the phase 2 trial. And this particular trial showed promising result. So, we can go ahead with phase 3 trials with this drug. The next is a novel antifungal therapy that is Phosmanogepix. It is for treatment of candidemia. This is again a phase 2 trial. Uh, this is given at a dose of 1000 mg IV twice daily. Uh, this is the loading dose and the maintenance dose is 6 mg IV once daily. And once you switch it from IV, you can give it orally 400 mg daily for day 4 and you give it a maximum for 14 days. The treatment success was found in 16 out of 20 patients and the 30 day survival was 85%. No treatment related side effects or discontinuation was seen. So it was found to be safe, well tolerated and efficacious therapy. Again, something which we can go ahead and do a phase three trial with. A brief regarding what this particular drug is. This is the pro drug for Manogepix. Manogepix is a enzyme inhibitor which inhibits the ionocetol pathway thereby blocking this GWT1 and with the blockade of this the GP1 enzyme or the protein is reduced. With that as you can see the manoprotein receptors are reduced and the protein synthesis is inhibited thereby impacting the survival of the fungus. The next is a important trial published in the American Journal of Critical Care Medicine. This uh, looked at the conservative versus liberal oxygenation targets, a randomized trial. They looked at if the low oxygenation target could lower the 28 day mortality. In the low oxygen group, they targeted a saturation of 91 to 94 with a PO2 of 55 to 80. And in high oxygenation, they targeted a saturation of 96 to 100 with PO2 of 110 to 150. In this, they could not find much difference in terms of the mortality rates and the adverse effects were also similar between the two groups and the study had to be reduced early because of the COVID-19 pandemic and because the power of the study was reduced so we are not very sure how to interpret this particular trial however in this they did not find much difference if we are either giving low oxygenation or high oxygenation. The next is a RCT in cardiac surgical patients with dexmedetomidine versus propofol. In this, they were looking at the delirium and the sedation rates. And they gave dexmedetomidine as 0.2 to 0.7 microgram per kg per hour and propofol as 1 to 2 milligram per kg per hour. Dexmedetomidine led to 2.2 hours less of mechanical ventilation and also reduced delirium that is 12% versus 25%. Now the conclusion is dexmedetomidine reduces the mechanical ventilation duration but it does not affect the ICU or total hospital length of stay. However, the delirium rates are definitely lesser with dexmedetomidine. Now next is the music intervention for anxiety reduction in critical ill patients. This is a multicentric RCT. In this they gave uh, music therapy. Uh, twice daily for three days. This was a 30 minute session and the music that was given was 
anything that the patient liked and the loud musics were avoided. The primary outcome was anxiety level assessed with a visual analog scale and the secondary outcomes were sleep quality and delirium. However, they found no reduction in terms of anxiety. However, fewer required opioids and lower sleep quality in the music group. Now, music does not decrease anxiety and the efficacy uh, is very context and intervention dependent. So, we cannot do it. Now, the effects of structural modal case deliberation on burnout symptoms. So, in this, they did a cluster randomized trial where they did this experiment on the ICU professionals and they tried to give them moral counseling sessions for emotionally disturbing cases and they tried to see with whether there was an impact of these MCD sessions on their burnout features. And uh, in this, the primary outcome was the burnout symptoms assessed by the MASHLAC burnout inventory secondary and moral distress by moral distress scale and safety attitude questionnaire. Uh, in terms of the results, it did not affect the emotional exhaustion or the depersonalization, reduced the personal accomplishment, but also reduced the moral distress, improved perception of the organizational support, leadership and the participation opportunities. MCD reduced the moral distress, but not emotional exhaustion or the depersonalization. It did not improve the team climate, but improved the overall organizational culture. The next is a post-op study in 30 versus 60 percent inspiratory oxygen in mechanically ventilated patients and they looked at atelectasis. And uh, in this they randomized one is to one. They looked at the percentage of post-op atelectatic volume by a CT. And they took 113 patients and did not find any significant results. So there is no much difference whether you are giving 30% FiO2 or 60% FiO2. The next is the use of a device which is mimicking the cuff that is mechanical insufflection device. This was used in acquired weakness patients of ICU acquired weakness. And MRC score of less than 48 was the inclusion criteria. They included 122 patients. However, they did not find any significant difference in terms of the acute respiratory failure incidence, the need for reintubation, the ICU length of stay or the mortality, whether it was 28 or 90 days. So the device does not prevent post extubation acute respiratory failure or the mortality. Further studies are recommended. The next is a novel sedation drug that is Ciprofol. It is being recently used in Australia and China and it was a non-inferiority trial. They wanted to compare whether it is comparable to propofol in terms of ICU sedation. They used the RAS scale for this. The primary endpoint success was 97% with ciprofol and propofol. The non-inferiority margin was 8% and the, there was a slightly longer recovery time with the ciprofol with no other significant difference in terms of the secondary outcome. So if you look at it, it was a well tolerated and it was non-inferior to propofol as far as sedation goes, requiring mechanical ventilation for at least 24 hours. The next is an important trial which was published in JAMA that is the ARREST trial. And in this they assessed for the expedite delivery to the cardiac center and whether if this resulted in an improvement in outcome for patients who had out of hospital cardiac arrest without ST elevation. And this was done in the UK and it was a one is to one randomized and uh, wanted to look for the all cause mortality at day 30. They recruited 862 patients out of this. They found that 63% was the mortality in both the groups and serious adverse event was 2% in the cardiac centers and 1% in the standard care. So transferring to a cardiac center did not actually reduce the mortality per se if the patient is taken to a specific cardiac center and the patient has a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. The next is a feasibility assessment of a biomarker guided kidney sparing bundle. Uh, this was a bundle which looked at the urinary biomarkers such as STEM2 and the IGF BP7 and they wanted to see whether using a bundle they could reduce the kidney outcomes. 
and this study was very small with just 19 patients which was again cut short because of COVID-19. Overall, they could assess that despite the low improvement, this is something which can be implemented with larger patients because most of the safety parameters could be achieved. The next is the use of concurrent uh, point of care ultrasound for acute dyspnea. And this was again a RCT where we had a standard group and a focus group. And in this, they found that using focus at the bedside for these patients and doing a serial assessment helped in greater reduction of the dyspnea index, especially in heart failure patients. So it helped us in guiding our therapy better and improve the outcomes. So a serial focus improves dyspnea management, especially in the background of an acute heart failure. The next is a study published in anesthesiology. This is PEEP titration in post-op atelectasis in obese patients. In this, they had a compliance guided PEEP management for the post-op atelectasis in bariatric patients. They randomized the patient to two groups, a standard 8 PEEP vis-a-vis a compliance guided PEEP. They had 40 patients and they found that post-op atelectasis was lower in dynamic compliance guided PEEP that is 9% versus 13% and a PF ratio was higher at one hour after the pneumoperitoneum in the dynamic group. So the PEEP guided by the dynamic compliance reduced post-op atelectasis but it did not affect the PF ratio much. Next is the use of dexmethetomidine in septic shock for immune paralysis. Uh, this was a small study and 24 septic shock patients were taken and the immune parameters were checked at baseline 12 and 24 hours and they did not find much difference and neither in terms of the immune parameters or the cardiac output. So dexmethetomidine does not affect the immune parameters at all. Next is the use of tranexamic acid in patients who are having an intracerebral hemorrhage and they are on NOAX that is the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. This is a phase 2 trial. In this they randomized the patient into two groups that is 63 patients were randomized but they found no difference in terms of the hematoma expansion whether they were in the placebo group or the tranexamic acid group. So currently there is no evidence that tranexamic acid prevents hematoma expansion in NOAC patients who develop an ICH. No safety concerns were though noted and probably we will need a large trial to find out the, exactly at which window period giving tranexamic acid may have some benefit but currently it definitely doesn't have any benefit. Next is the transcutaneous electrical diaphragmatic stimulation in mechanical ventilated patients. This is again an RCT. This was done to assess whether this transcutaneous stimulation of diaphragm can reduce the diaphragmatic dysfunction, improve the respiratory muscle function in mechanical ventilation. In this they recruited 66 patients and they found the diaphragmatic thickening fraction was more than 30% in the TEDS group versus 54% in the sham group that is the placebo group and the maximum inspiratory pressure and the peak expiratory flow were similar in both the groups and then there was no difference in the extubation failure group. The patients who were included were the ICU patients on ventilator. So TEDS did not show a significant impact in preventing diaphragm dysfunction or improving the inspiratory muscle strength in mechanically ventilated patients. The next study is the use of valsaclovir for Epstein-Barr virus suppression in a moderate to severe COPD. This was a RCT which was done in the Northern Islands. They randomized 84 patients and they found that valsaclovir is safe and effective in suppressing the EPV replication in COPD patients and also reduces the sputum inflammatory cell infiltrates though a larger study is probably needed before we can use it in our practice. Lastly a video laryngoscope study for expected difficult airway this was in a Canadian journal of anesthesia study they compared the Y scope which is a straight weight versus a Macintosh video laryngoscope and they used it in anticipated difficult airway patients. So it was a prospective randomized non-inferiority trial and in this they had two sets of 29 patients and the Y-scope showed non-inferior POGO scores compared to the video laryngoscope 
and the time to intubation was longer with the Y scope compared to the video gynecoscope. The first attempt and the overall success rate was similar in both the groups and four accidental esophageal intubations occurred in the Y scope. So Y scope can be considered as non-inferior to the video laryngoscope for laryngeal visualization but had a longer time to intubation and both of the devices had similar success. Thank you for your patience and please uh, comment below if you want us to elaborate on any particular study. So we will do a further video where we will look into the more detailed aspect of these studies. Thank you.